Hi, everyone. I am Alan Filipowicz. Uh, I'm a clinical professor of management and organizations uh, over at the Johnson School at Cornell University. Uh, I'm also the faculty director of the, uh, of the upcoming uh, EPM program that I'm very, very excited about. And I wanted to spend uh, a few minutes this morning talking about leading through crisis or leading during crisis, uh, emotional and social intelligence. Uh, unfortunately, the, the, the format of this session, this very short session, is going to be slightly different from what we do in the EPM program in that I won't be able to see you and I won't be able to get your direct comments back. During the program itself, because we have a smaller class, uh, I'll be able to see all the participants, we'll be able to chat with each other, uh, uh, and uh, we, will, we will be able to, uh, to have a, a, essentially a full classroom experience. What we're doing now is, is the equivalent of a large lecture hall, right? So, so I'm standing on a stage, there are lots and lots of students in, in, in a large lecture hall, and, and the communication is more, uh, is more unidirectional, except that if you have questions, clarifying questions or things that, that, that you don't quite understand that, that you would like uh, more input on, uh, please enter those questions in the chat. We have people monitoring the chat and they will feed that information uh, back over, uh, they will feed that information back over to you and I'll try to incorporate it in, in the things we're saying. Okay, so, so without, uh, without further ado, uh, thank you so much for, for joining me. Uh, let's, talk, uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, emotional and uh, social intelligence Okay, so uh, what I'm gonna do is raise three ideas, is raise three big ideas. And, and we'll see that those, those three big ideas are, are related. And so, and so the idea is this, the first idea is this, we're gonna talk about effort. And we're gonna talk about giving up in the face of repeated failure or not. And then we're gonna talk about exploration. We're gonna talk about why pointing out errors is bad. And those of you who are following closely should appreciate the meta joke embedded in there. And then the third thing we're gonna talk about is understanding. So why do other people do what they do? And then we're gonna see that those three ideas function in the loop. And, and if you can sort your way through this, right? If you can, if you can sort out sort of the challenges that are, that are raised by these three things, by the effort piece, by the exploration piece, and by the understanding piece, then, then that requires emotional intelligence, but it also will show a high degree of emotional intelligence and it shows a high degree of social intelligence as well. All right, so let's start with effort. And I wanna ask you uh, two, essentially uh, what you would do in, 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 two, separate, in two separate scenarios. Uh, and, and the first, I'm gonna give you a culturally specific example and then, and then we'll, we'll, we'll broaden it out to, uh, we'll, broaden, we'll broaden it out. So a culturally specific example is this. In, in the US, there's, a, there's a, a culture of do it yourself, right? Uh, and, and this is driven by, by climate and, and, and space uh, uh, essentially. But if, if you live somewhere, right? You probably have a car and you have a house and, and you know, depending on where you are, you may have a boat, et cetera. When, when these things break, you fix them yourself. Not because you can't find the mechanic to fix it, but because it's fun, right? This is what people do. Uh, I have a very small boat and the small boat has a little upward motor on it. And in order to turn the boat, you turn the steering wheel and the motor turns. And at the beginning of the season, I got the boat out and polished it up and it was all ready. And I was very happy to be able to take the boat out onto the water. Uh, and I turned the steering wheel and the motor didn't move at all. Now, I figured this is not a problem. It's rusted up a little bit. It's seized up a little bit over the winter because in the, the winters here are very harsh. You have to take all the boats out of the wall. Uh, and so I, I took the steering wheel and I jiggled it about a little bit and nothing happened. So I thought, okay, this is gonna take a stronger effort. And so I, I got behind the boat, the boat was up on land and I grabbed the motor and I jiggled it around a little bit and nothing happened. So then I took a, a spray, a rust removing spray and I sprayed it on all the relevant joints and then I shook the steering wheel and I shook the motor and nothing happened. In other words, this is a problem where you try something and it fails, you try something else and it fails and you try something else and it fails, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and we face this all the time, right? So, so 
uh, one of my favorites is trying to get electronic device A to work with electronic device B. And you try it and it doesn't work and you look something up and it doesn't work and you call the helpline and it doesn't work, et cetera, et cetera. Or you're writing code and you're trying to get the code to do something and you try something and it doesn't work and you try something else, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, or you're trying to get in contact with a client or convince the client that they wanna do something and you try A, et cetera. And so the question to you is, so how many times do you repeat? How many times do you keep trying something different until you finally give up in the face of repeated failure? And, and I, I, want you to note, I want you to note this down. And so the question is, would you try more than once? Probably. Would you try more than three times? Would you try more than five times? Would you try more than 10 times? Would you try more than 50 times? Would you try more than 100 times? Right? How many different things do you try? Let me give you a second example, though. Let me give you a second example. And I'm assuming that you either do or do not know how to juggle. And I'm going to teach you how to juggle. So here is how to juggle. It's very, very simple conceptually. When you're juggling, you're going to have an object that goes from one hand, and it makes an arc, and it lands in the other hand. And that's all juggling is. Except what happens when you're really juggling is the object, you have two objects in one hand, one object in the other hand, you're gonna juggle with three. One object will go up and when it gets to its peak, then you throw this one. So this one will come down and this one will go up. And when this one gets to its peak, now you're gonna throw this one and these two will switch and on down the line. And so juggling, juggling looks essentially like that. It's one piece goes up, then the other piece goes up, and then this piece goes up and this piece goes up. And they just keep interleaving. So essentially juggling is a series of arcs, a series of throws, and the throws are interleaved. They're happening halfway through each other. Now, that is how you juggle. If you don't already know how to juggle, you can learn and you can learn very quickly. And here's my question to you. How many times do you try before you think juggling is impossible? Would you try three times? Would you try five times? Would you try 10 times? A hundred times? You'll notice in the second example that you're most probably going to try many, many more times than in the first example. In fact, to learn how to juggle, you should probably try hundreds and hundreds of times. And when you do, then you'll learn how to juggle, right? You'll be able to solve the problem. Now, what is the difference? And this is, this is a fundamentally important issue. And the, the, the difference has to do with something called learned helplessness, which is a very, very old idea, but it turns out it's quite relevant today. So in the face of repeated setbacks, when do we give up? When do we stop all efforts? And we stop when we learn that the situation is unchangeable. Now, two quick insights on this. One is that depression is marked by a tendency to see negative events as time invariant. That is the mark of depression. Something bad is happening, and the person thinks this badness is going to continue forever, time invariant. But the other insight on this is that if you think a situation is unchangeable, that essentially implies a huge amount of stability in the world, which is really very interesting because the world is becoming much, much more chaotic and not more stable. The reason I raise this is we are facing a massive crisis. We're facing a crisis on multiple levels, a health crisis, an economic crisis, et cetera. What do we do? Well, we try stuff. Now, the, the situations that we're facing are enormously complex. It should not be surprising to us that the first thing we try doesn't work. And the second thing we try doesn't work and the third thing we try doesn't work. And the question is, how many tries before we expect success? If you're viewing this like learning how to juggle, where you think, okay, this is learnable, but it's gonna take me hundreds of tries, that is a completely different mindset than if you think that this is something like uh, you know, solving, solving a simple connectivity issue, an electronics connectivity issue, where you think I'll call the help desk, they'll tell me what to do, and then it will work. That is one try at the most two tries. 
And so this view of is the situation changeable or unchangeable is a very important one. The problem in a crisis, the problem in a complex crisis like the one we're facing is that the odds of getting to a quick solution are exactly zero. And so we need to think about how many tries realistically do we think it's gonna take before we get to a solution? And my suggestion is that you recognize that this number is enormously high. But let's go a little bit further in this direction because the flip side of learned helplessness is something called self-efficacy. That is, you're convinced that you can get the job done. Now, if you're convinced that you can get the job done, what happens is rather than your effort going to zero in the face of setbacks, your effort increases in the face of setbacks. And not only does the intensity increase, but the persistence, that is you try harder and you try harder for longer. In other words, this is the diametric opposite of learned helplessness. And learned helplessness is what we get when we try something and it fails and we try and fail and try and fail. When you get into a situation where you know beforehand this is gonna take lots and lots of failure. And I'm gonna suggest that we're in that situation right now, then what you need to do is not only be aware of the learned helplessness, but you need to develop self-efficacy. And self-efficacy is something that's changeable. When you change it, what happens is a massive jump in performance, 28%. And this is a very, very uh, uh, stable finding, a very robust uh, finding from an empirical point of view, right? So 114 studies, 21,000 people, a range of contexts, job search success, adaptability to new technology, research productivity, which is becoming really relevant now, et cetera. Uh, and all of these jump by a huge amount, 28% is a massive increase because we were able to convince the person that they have what it takes to get the job done. That is, if you think, I can definitely learn how to juggle, you will spend much more time, more intensity and more persistence of efforts than someone who thinks I will never learn how to juggle. If you think I can get this motor to turn with a steering wheel, you will have a higher intensity and persistence of efforts than if you think the opposite. If you think I can get this code to work, I can get in contact with a client, I can convince the client of the, the thing that I'm trying to, of the value that I'm, that I'm trying to bring them, you will try longer and you will try harder. And so the question is, all right, so how, how do we change this belief? And this is malleable. That's the really interesting thing. There are essentially three levers to change your belief in your ability to get the job done. And one is simply, have you done something like this before? If you got it to work last time, then you'll try again this time. And in fact, even if you've gotten a little piece of it to work last time, then you'll try longer and harder this time. Skills training, like what we're going to be doing in the EPM program, is another way to change your beliefs in your ability to get the job done. So not only will you learn things, but because of the way we're doing it, you'll start to think, yep, I can solve this problem. You get out of the program, you get a complex problem, you try the first time it fails, your, your, your efforts fail, but because you think, wait, I've learned something in this program, and I guarantee you will, now you're gonna try again. You're gonna try harder, you're gonna try for longer. And the, the result of that, not surprisingly, is a big increase in performance. The second is, does someone else like you, is someone else like you able to do it? If Bob can do it, then anyone can do it, right? Bob is a hypothetical other person. Uh, this, this happens both as a comparative thing, but also through vicarious learning. You watch how they do it and then, and then you try to do it. And then the third one, and this one becomes really important, is a credible source. When someone whom you trust says, hey, you can do this, then you're going to try harder. You're going to try harder for longer. So when I called the mechanic and said, this is the problem I'm facing, they said, that's a common problem and it is solvable. Now this gets me to go back and try and keep trying and keep trying because the mechanic whom I trust on this issue has told me that it is a solvable, has told me that it is a solvable problem. All right, so, so that's the first idea. The first idea is effort, giving up in the face of repeated failure or not. And if you believe a situation is unchangeable, your effort goes to zero. But if you believe you can get the job done, right? Implying not only that the situation is changeable, but that you can solve it, 
then the intensity and the persistence of your efforts go up in the face of setbacks. And my recommendation to you is do not leave this to chance, right? Don't go into a situation and hope that you believe that you have what it takes to get the job done. You can actually alter this belief. Look for examples when you've done something similar, examples when you've learned relevant skills. Find other people like you who have done this thing. Find people who are credible, who will tell you that you're able to do it. Okay, let's go to exploration. Why pointing out errors is bad. Did you guys figure out the joke here, right? Why pointing out errors is bad, right? Keep working on that. All right, so, so imagine, imagine you have a small child and the small child is about to run into the street where there's, busy, where there's a lot of traffic. What do you do? Well, you yell at the child, right? You give them strong negative feedback. Why? Because you want to stop that behavior immediately. Negative feedback stops behavior. It is fantastic for that. Now, imagine that you have a child that's trying to learn how to paint. What do you do when their initial painting is not what you might consider art? Would you use the same reaction that you would when the small child is about to run into traffic? That is, would you, would you give them uh, intense negative feedback? My guess is, my, my hope is probably not, right? You're probably not gonna give the same feedback to a child learning how to paint than to a child who is running into the street. What would you do with a child learning how to paint? Well, of course, you would give them positive, encouraging feedback. Positive feedback promotes behavior. You get more of stuff with positive feedback. But there's a related item, and the related item is simply this. Positive feedback will promote risk-taking and exploration. Negative feedback will stop risk-taking and exploration. So if you have someone who's trying to solve an intractable problem, who's trying to solve an incredibly difficult problem, and they are not succeeding, which by the way is not a surprise because it's a difficult problem, and you give them negative feedback, they're going to come back and be less creative and be less innovative in trying to solve that problem. And yet, this is what we do. Have you solved this yet? Why not? You need to work harder, etc. The negative feedback that you're giving the person is in fact killing their ability to explore. And so, as I mentioned, positive feedback not only enables behavior, it promotes risk-taking and exploration, Negative feedback stops behavior, right? High information content, it's very, very useful for that, but it curtails risk-taking and exploration. And we have a tendency to use negative feedback in situations where we really, really should not. Because if you use negative feedback when someone is trying to solve an enormously difficult problem, that is going to keep them from exploring, from taking risks, from finding the solution. All right, so, so the, second, the second idea is you want to match the feedback to the situation. And in particular, why is pointing out errors bad? Well, pointing out errors is bad if the errors are around something that requires risk-taking and exploration to succeed. So, so if you give a person negative feedback in that case, the negative feedback is doing exactly the opposite of what you want, right? If you want the person to fail, negative feedback curtails risk-taking exploration. If you want them to succeed, then you have to be extremely careful about this. And remember, if we're dealing in a situation where people are stressed, and I'm gonna suggest once again that we are currently living through exactly that situation, our tendency to revert to the negative feedback is very high. Why? Because negative feedback gives you an immediate reaction in certain situations, child running into the street, give them negative feedback, they stop immediately. And we remember that. We think I need a reaction fast. And so I'm gonna use negative feedback, which, is, which will get me a faster reaction. And it's gonna do exactly the opposite of what you want. Okay, so here's the third idea then. The third idea is understanding others. So why, why did they do that? Uh, so, so there, there's a, sorry, to go back on, on the feedback question, uh, you have to point out mistakes on the team. Uh, how do I tell them that they're wrong, but also help them to be, uh, to be a better performer? Well, remember, 
you, you want to match your feedback to the situation. If the person is doing something that is a pure execution task, right? That is that what they need to do is very, very clear. There's no need for exploration. Then negative feedback is great if they're doing something that you want them to stop. Negative feedback is terrible if they are not doing something that you want them to do. That is, if you want someone to do more of something, you have to give them positive feedback around that. If you want them to do less of something, you give them negative feedback. And it's, it's a very useful tool. I'm not saying don't give negative feedback. Very useful tool to stop behavior, positive feedback to drive behavior. So, so you're stopping some behaviors, you're driving other behaviors. But if the person is doing something that requires risk-taking and exploration, if they're trying to crack this client that's impossible to get to, negative feedback is going to stop exactly the risk-taking and exploration that is needed in order to succeed. That is, if they are in an exploration type situation, then negative feedback is an awful idea. If they're in an execution situation, negative feedback is a very useful tool. Not, I'm not saying never use negative feedback, but be aware of the very high cost of negative feedback in exploration type situations. Okay, so understanding other people, why did they do that? So here is the, here is the third piece. Uh, and the, the idea is simply that People do what they do for only three reasons. This is the spanning set of reasons. There is no other reason for behavior. One is, one is an internal cause. That is something about the person, right? They're doing that because they're interested, because they're motivated, because they're brave, because they're honest, etc. This, however, in reality, explains very little behavior. Behavior is really driven by two things. And one is social influence, what other people want you to do. And the other is situational constraints, what the environment lets you do. And the challenge that we have is we often have to answer the question, why did someone doing that? And we don't have time. We don't have the resources to ask them directly. And so we guess. And the only way to guess better, right? Because there's no sort of direct path to the truth. The only way to guess better is to guess multiple times. Why guess multiple times? Well, simply because if you only have one guess, then when contradictory information comes in, you'll ignore it. If you have two guesses, competing hypotheses, when contradictory information comes in, then you'll try to see where it fits. So you are much, much more likely to update your guess as to why someone did that if in fact, if in fact, you have two guesses rather than just one. But how do you make two guesses without spending more time, right? You already are, are time pressured. You can't spend twice or three times as much time thinking about other people. What do you do? Well, the recommendation is you practice until this guessing becomes automatic. Practice what? Well, practice explaining behavior using the categories that you don't tend to use. So, so remember, there are only three categories, something about the person, that's what we tend to use to explain behavior, social influence, that is other people pushing the person to do a thing, and situational constraints. Situational constraints is what the environment lets you do, and this includes the person's physical state. This is enormously important because our tendency to default back to it's something about the person is very, very well learned. That is, it's going to happen all the time. And when it does, it will drive negative emotions in you. I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you this, an, an example. It's a very personal example, uh, but it, it's fascinating to me because, because it's happening. It's happening in now. Uh, I'm very aware of these things, and yet I still have to practice. I still have to practice to be sure that I come up with multiple explanations. And the example is this. So I'm, I'm living with my mother. Uh, uh, she's technically, she's living with us, but uh, uh, she's 89. And she has no short-term memory. Now, fortunately, and we're very, very, we're very, very, uh, you know, happy about this. Physically, she's in great, she's in great shape. She's very healthy. Cognitively, she, she thinks logically, she'll have conversations with you. Everything sounds exactly right, except that, 10 minutes later, she won't remember that conversation. Now, what happens? Well, what happens is she'll do things 
that are very, very surprising. And she does things that are very, very surprising simply because she doesn't have this lagging memory. So for example, uh, she often wants to clear the table. That is, we'll sit down for a meal, we'll finish the meal, and she wants to bring the plates back. She wants to clear the table. And we tell her not to do that because if she's not very stable on her feet, if she drops something, she's gonna break the glassware. Now that in itself is a trivial thing, except that the next thing she does is she'll try to pick it up. And when she tries to pick it up, odds are that she might get cut, right? And so a tiny little thing, a, a desire to take stuff off the table will soon escalate into a major problem, particularly if no one is around. And so I explained to her, do not clear the table. When you're done eating, simply go away, right? However, on a fairly systematic basis, I can be teaching and I'll hear in the background glass shattering. And so I'll go up and see what's going on and what's going on and she will have attempted to take the glass off the table, have dropped it, and will now be trying to pick it up. Now, when I see this, my instantaneous reaction is anger. How many times do I have to tell you the same thing? What is wrong with you? And why are you doing this? Do you notice how all of these are driven by the idea that in fact, something about the person, that is my mother makes a decision to do something. When what's driving the behavior are two other things. One is social influence, that is a norm from her distant past, which told her the polite thing to do after a meal is to clear the table, very deeply embedded. But the second, more important, is this physical constraint, this, this constraint on her ability to remember. That is, even if she broke a glassware at breakfast, by lunch, she will not remember. Now, if I remember these two things, then my response is completely different than it would have been had, in fact, she remembers what we told her before. That is, this individual is not a young child who is learning things. It is an older person who is, in fact, forgetting things and forgetting things at a rate that makes it impossible to learn. Now, the reason I raise this story and spend so much time on this story is every single instant, I have to catch myself and recognize, wait a minute, social drivers, situational drivers. And when I do that, my response is much more useful. However, simply hearing this, hearing this idea is not going to be enough for you. This is something you need to practice. Practice explaining behavior, by social influence, practice explaining behavior, by situational constraints in the environment. And that will give you a set of explanations um, that will give you a set of explanations uh, that, uh, that will give you a set of explanations that allow you uh, to come up with much more useful solutions. What I wanna do, what I wanna do very quickly. Uh... So Alan, yes, we have a few questions. Yeah. So, so let me let me look. Uh, I'm going to spend one minute on the questions, and then and then I'm going to uh, and then I'm going to uh, wrap this up. So one so one question uh, so one question is how to deal with erratic people who are hooked on to past experiences. Perseverance may not help always. How do I manage emotional intelligence in this situation? So so remember this person. Why are they doing that? Right. If you think, when you say an erratic person, right, it, is that a willful activity? That, that is, they've decided to be hooked on past experience. That is ignoring social influence and situational constraints. So, so how do you rectify that? Well, from the social influence side, right, can you put pressure on them from other people to behave in the way you'd like them to behave? That is, can you get enough other people around them that do the things that you'd like this person to do that send them in the right direction? And from a situational constraint, can you set things up so that they do the things that you want them to do? And can you remove the drivers in doing this? Can you remove the drivers uh, from the past, from the past uh, experiences, right? So, you, so, so you, have to, you have to work on all of these. But remember, if the person is er acting erratically, 
it, it is not willful activity on their part, right? It's not willful activity on their part. Let me give you an example. Someone turns up to work. They have a broken arm, right? They are not performing the way they should on a physical task. You tell them, perform better. They don't do it. You, you try to give them bonuses. They don't do it. You threaten them. They don't. In fact, the performance gets worse. Why? Well, because it's not the person. It's being driven by a physical constraint. Okay. Uh, so, so, so when negative feedback is shared with me, I break down and that affects me personally. So, so that question is somewhat out of the scope of the, of the ideas we talked about, but the basic idea is what you're saying, what you're doing is you're taking the negative feedback and rather than using it to interpret the current behavior, you're using it as a predictor of what's going to happen in the future. You've given it that time invariance, and it's that that's giving it that emotional impact, right? If the negative feedback only refers to the current ongoing behavior, then fine, change the current ongoing behavior. It has no implication for what's going to happen tomorrow. Uh, how can I manage team members who come with hail effect from the previous teams? Um, so, so actually a halo effect is kind of a good thing it is as long as the person uses the halo effect to believe that they can get the job done and their effort uh, continues, right? The, the reason the halo effect, the, the situations in which the halo effect is problematic are those situations where people believe that effort is no longer necessary. Effort is always, always necessary. The halo effect should tell you that you can increase your effort in the face of intractable problems and you will succeed. Not, you can stop working now. And so you can be explicit with a person about that. That is, in the past you've succeeded because of effort. That means that you are capable of these high levels of effort, you, but you have this belief in your ability to get the job done. That belief is incredibly valuable, but it needs to translate into effort. It needs to translate into effort. That is, even when the job is simple, you need to continue to make the effort. That's the, that's the, the halo effect. Okay, so, so we're, we're running out of time. I wanna, I wanna wrap this up very, very quickly. Uh, so why they do that, always include social and situational drivers, particularly if the action seems willful. And here is, here is the loop, which we'll take one second to do. Someone did it on purpose, right? Uh, they're acting erratically, et cetera. This ignores, this ignores the other drivers. And so you give that person predominantly negative feedback and remember you're a credible source and what happens, the other person stops exploring and their effort drops, which objectively confirms your assessment. This is the common loop. In both of the questions that we had, this is, this is somewhat embedded, but look at the other thing. If you focus on social and situational influence and you give positive feedback only, that is positive feedback when you're facing a, a, an exploration situation, and you change the field in their behavior, that is you alter the playing field so that it favors the person, this is the situational constraints, the other will not only try harder because of the, 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 uh, the self-efficacy piece, but they will explore more. And that is gonna also objectively confirm your assessment. That is, you can drive this loop up or you can drive this loop down. The problem with the current crisis and crises in general is it makes our tendency to drive the loop down in the negative direction much, much more strongly. And so it's, it, is, it is even more important, it's even more critical that we're aware of these pieces, the effort piece, the exploration piece, uh, and our interpretation piece, our understanding piece, and that we put them together in a way that we are driving behavior up, even though the person that we're dealing with is consistently failing in spite of our best efforts. All right. Thank you very much. It was, uh, it was a pleasure working with you all. Uh, again, thank you for your questions in, in the program itself. We'll have much, much higher levels of interactivity. I'll be able to see you, we'll be able to talk directly, et cetera. And I, I very much look forward to, to seeing you there. Uh, John and the XED team, thank you guys for, for uh, as always, for your, for your very uh, excellent logistics help. Thank you, thank you, Professor. Goodbye, bye-bye. Thank you, bye-bye.